want to talk uh, uh, quickly, you know, we have 30 minutes here, which is a very small amount of time, but I do want to try to cover uh, a variety of topics about who we were, who we are, mostly where we're going with additive. And you're going to see that I focus quite a bit on the additive metal side of things, which is really the strength of our company. Um, and uh, we do polymers, but, but additive metals has a lot more play within aviation than the polymer side does. So let me just give you a little bit of pre-GE uh, acquisition history. We used to be called Morris Technologies and Rapid Quality Manufacturing. Uh, Morris Technologies began our operations in 1994, so uh, we weren't quite at the very beginning, but we were pretty early in on the rapid prototyping industry at the time. We had uh, stereolithography at the time and a couple of very expensive unigraphic boxes and SDRC IDS software for our engineering capabilities. So uh, if you, anybody involved in the industry that long a period of time will remember the technology was really expensive back then, um, has come down in some ways. What really turned the corner for us as a company, we were a rapid prototyping service provider and engineering design firm. So what really turned the corner for us was in 2003, we acquired an EOS direct metal laser centering machine uh, and put that into North America in 03. And that was the first powder bed laser-based machine that we got involved in. Uh, right up to the acquisition, uh, we had about 135 employees and our services included predominantly engineering design, additive metals, some additive plastics, uh, and post uh, CNC machining, those type of capabilities. But really, by the time we were acquired in November uh, of last year, it was additive metals was our predominant focus in uh, the aerospace, medical, and other industries. So, as I just mentioned, we used to be Morris Technologies, we used to be Rapid Quality Manufacturing. Now we're GE Aviation. We are now called, Morris Technologies is called, the Additive Development Center. So we love acronyms in this industry and at GE. So ADC is what we're called and we focus in on prototype, new product introduction, R&D efforts. RQM is now what we call our additive lean lab. So they're the guys who always were trying to take additive metals and productionize the process so that we would go out to customers and offer production components. So RQM is now called the additive lean lab and their mission in life is to take a component that is developed and start to make it very efficient for production. Our timeline in additive metals, as I said, began in 2003. And at that time, we worked, uh, GE was probably one of our first customers when we started in business in 1994. And they certainly were one of our first and major customers when we started working with additive metals. So we quickly found out when we, when we brought the technology to North America, we thought maybe mold inserts would be about 75, 80% of our business and parts would be uh, 20%. You know, as it turned out, it was completely the opposite. In fact, it was way more making parts than making mold inserts. So GE was one of our first clients in this and we worked with two predominant groups. We worked with their, what's called TFE or Test Facilities Engineering Group and we worked with the Combustion Group. And they were about the same time we started working with these engineers and designers for different applications. So on the screen, you can see some uh, what are called instrumentation rakes on the top. And on the bottom of that beginning timeline, you see some of the beginning fuel components that we started working with the combustion group on. So I apologize, my screen seems to be a little off here. PowerPoint's a little bit off. But as I mentioned, we focus on polymers, we focus on metals. And the alloys that we offer today, you can take a look and see many of the alloys that we're working with. So all of those alloys, we work in the laser-based uh, systems. And then the red uh, little uh, hexagons, those are the alloys that we work with on the uh, RCAM system. Now, recently you probably are aware that GE acquired Avio Aero. As part of that acquisition, we acquired Avio Prop. And Avio Prop is very, uh, very focused on the electron beam technology. So I would add uh, some of the inner metallics like Thai aluminide up to this list at this point in time through the EBM process. And I'll get to that in just a little bit. So broad brush, we don't have time to get into a, a ton of different detail here, but really the super alloys from our perspective and, and back in the 2005 time frame, the super alloys are what took this technology of additive metals and really pushed it into a new height. So 
before, in 2003, we had OK alloys, and we could come up with detailed components we made for a variety of applications. But the super alloys, like cobalt chromium, was our first one we worked with. That allowed us to actually make components we could go functionally test in a jet engine uh, test cell and uh, in medical components. So it was really a turning point for us, at least in our opinion in the industry, as to how the alloys drove the applications and the technology forward. Very broad brush. Again, I don't have time to go into a huge amount of details, but what we find when we produce actual components in these metals, whether they're Inconels, whether they are uh, the cobalt chrome, stainless steels, titanium, we find that these alloys tend to be wrought-like in their structure and in their mechanical, uh, mechanical properties, which is that, that if you're not in the industry, if you don't understand that, that implication, what it really means is the uh, span of applications we can push the technology into are much greater than if we were dealing with uh, mechanical components that were cast-like or even less than cast properties. So we do have some materials that we've fully characterized. Cobalt chromium would be one of those materials, but we don't have a, a ton of those fully characterized. So although we have a lot of alloys we work with, engineers and designers typically want to see what are my material curves that I'm designing with. And, and that's, a, that's a topic that we I'll circle back later on the presentation that we need to cover. And I think uh, in this technology, we have a really big opportunity uh, to work in novel alloys, to, to create the unobtainium, if you will, something that, that provides for material and, and uh, part properties that you otherwise can't get by casting or machining out of a uh, rod or forged piece of material. So design and, and alloys will be a big part going forward. Uh, I mentioned uh, some of the characteristics. Cobalt chrome slide behind me is showing you what the microstructure looks like. So for some of you who are more technical, uh, you'll start to quickly realize what this process is capable of doing. In essence, we're welding at a very thin layer, 20 micron layer typically, up to 50. And what happens is we have a melt pool and we're rapidly solidifying, which gives us this kind of grain structure. That's why we're getting rot-like properties. And it compares very favorably to ASTM rot material. This is, happens to be F75 or cobalt chromium. It's one of the alloys that I'll talk about with our fuel nozzle uh, that we're going to bring into uh, production pretty quickly. So how do we leverage additive within GE? Well, today we're, added, uh, we're, we're actually leveraging the technology in the aerospace world and other GE businesses, primarily uh, for new product introduction. So by that I mean, we're able to shorten the cycle time dramatically of what it might take to get some components made. So NPI hardware is an absolutely huge component of how we leverage and use additive metals within aviation. Now clearly we want to take this technology to the next level. We want to productionize it. We want to find those applications where it will make it onto the next generation engine. Um, and I'll talk about one of those here in just a second. But there is tremendous cost savings, tremendous time savings. When we can make a titanium part or we can make a Inco 718 or 625 part and we can accelerate the design process and squeeze the schedules. We are under tremendous pressure right now as GE Aviation to, in, uh, to uh, basically come up with a number of engine programs in a very short period of time. We have three major engine programs going right now, just the major ones. And so uh, Leap X or Leap 56 is uh, one that's in the news quite a bit. That's the one that's driving our fuel nozzle into production. But we have other engine programs, and this is a, an historic period of time for GE Aviation where we're trying to squeeze a number of new product introductions through our supply chain, through GE, through the engineering areas, and come out the other end with new engines uh, that have very high expectations for performance with our customers. So one big area. Uh, you know, let me give you a couple examples how we've leveraged and used the technology. So up here you'll see an example of some high pressure turbine blades. And in fact, you see a, uh, it's a sample part, so what the picture is, not a real part, but it's representative of a high pressure turbine blade for the Leap 56 engine. You'll also see an x-ray image of the inner passage. That's all additively built, so there is, that's not an investment casting. So how have we used the technology? Well, we've done at least seven projects now for GE and for others when we were Morris Technologies, but for GE specifically, where we made a group of these high pressure turbine blades additively. And that's no small feat because what we're doing is we're trying to replicate a single crystal 
investment cast. But we did this additively, and, and to rest assured, this is not going on any production engine. Uh, we're probably a pretty long way away from that happening because that's rotating hardware that has some extreme stresses to it. But for a test piece of hardware to go into a test cell, this is a, a phenomenal cost savings and time savings. Whereas it might take nine to 12 months to get those castings, say 70 to 100 castings made and finished to be able to put into the test rig, uh, we accomplished that in about three and a half months. So we've cut that time down by a third or a fourth. Uh, we're probably about 10 to 15 percent cost difference, meaning lower cost. So actually in this particular case, we do uh, show a cost reduction, but most importantly, we show a compressed time. And that's very, uh, very critical. Uh, the fuel swirlers is another one. This is an example of a land-based gas turbine engine. So in this particular photo, uh, this is a uh, fueling component that goes into a, a land-based gas turbine engine. Uh, that part is highly complex. Uh, it, you can see a little bit of that through the cutaway, but it has many passages, different blades, uh, and frankly, that would be impossible to produce in any traditional manufacturing methodology. If at the very least, I would say it'd be impractical. So uh, in this particular case, uh, we were able to uh, produce a number of these components within three months, and uh, we were able to uh, meet all of the performance criteria that the GE engineers were looking for in that particular item. Okay, now I want to talk specifically about one of the items that uh, a lot of you have heard about. Uh, Todd actually uh, had in his presentation in the morning session, and that's the Leap Fuel Nozzle. So this, is, this has been getting quite a bit of press, and uh, GE has uh, fortunately allowed me to talk a little bit about this in the last year. Uh, there are things, of course, I can't talk about. Um, so you're going to see external shots of this fuel nozzle, and that doesn't t really tell the story, but uh, I'll, I'll talk through some of the other items about it. So we began the, uh, the TAPS program. Um, back in the early 2000s as GE. Our entry into that, of course, was Morris Technologies, and that was in 2003 that we started working with that combustion group. So around 2006, 2007, that the cobalt chrome alloy came out, and that took the, uh, the projects into a whole different light because that allowed us to go from just having a semi-functional component to something that could actually be fired in a test engine. But the design changed uh, pretty radically over a period of time. So we started with components for the GE NX engine, and uh, we made a couple of components for that particular fuel nozzle. And then we gradually started to work with the combustion team to refine the design from what you see as the first uh, prototype testing of that fuel nozzle into what you see is uh, the, the, uh, up there on the uh, 2011 time frame. And that's kind of the, uh, the end way that this fuel nozzle looks today. So a little bit about this, our entry into service. So we're, we're already actually on test, uh, a test engine on a test stand in Ohio. Uh, that just started about three weeks ago. And our entry into service timeline is 2016. So that means we're at first engine to test. We have to get through FETT and then we go to SETT, second engine to test and so on. But really production for us begins in 2016. Now that might sound like a, a fairly long way uh, from today, but in our world, that's actually very compressed. So we have a lot of work to do uh, to productionize the process, to put in the machines, to put in the facilities in order to produce these components. So the number up here is around 40,000 components that we'll be producing, not in 2016, but when we ramp up to full production, uh, about the 2022, 2023 timeframe, we'll be needing to make around 40,000 of these nozzles per year. So, so why are we using additive? Why not some of the traditional methodologies that fuel nozzles have been made with in the past, which consists of machine components, investment cast components, uh, fabricated components, brazed, welded together to make a fuel nozzle, and, and some proprietary technology from the suppliers. The reason is because we're going to see through the design of the process the capability to make these fuel nozzles more durable than what they have been in the past. And you can see a number up here. We uh, are testing to date to show that we're hitting at least a 5x durability rating on this fuel nozzle compared to previous generation fuel nozzles. So why is that happening? It's not certainly a material play. It's happening because of the design. And this is what I can't show you, although I would love to show you, is that the design of the fuel nozzle inside, what you can't see, are some just phenomenal uh, complexity of passages and uh, uh, fuel delivery areas that make this component almost a uh, 
almost a heat exchanger, if you will. So we're using the fuel to cool, to, uh, cool the fuel nozzle as it's in operation. And uh, I wish I could show you that, but that actually is the, uh, the most proprietary aspect of what we've come up with. So probably after 2016, we'll be able to start showing those kind of components. We also get less weight, less weight compared to the previous generation. So we're about 25% less weight. Why does that matter? I think it's pretty obvious uh, on flying aircraft that uh, if you can take a pound out of the aircraft, it has a huge cost savings. Uh, there are a lot of different numbers and statistics for what that is. But uh, suffice it to say that this is a big deal. We look to the future of additive in the aircraft engine world and in the, uh, uh, the aviation world in general as being an enabler to reduce weight to reduce fuel cost and consumption and thus cost. We also took it from tw literally 20 different components that were welded brazed together down to one. So we grow it. We don't weld and braze. So that has huge ramifications in the repair side of things, in our lifing. That's why we're 5X more durable, another reason. Because we don't have 20 different pieces that we're brazing and welding. We now have one piece that we grow. So that has tremendous ramifications on the repair side and on, on the cost of repair. And it is also less cost. Uh, GE has the proprietary information on these designs using additive. and that will ultimately lead for a higher market share uh, due to uh, having that insourced versus outsourced. In fact, there's a JV between GE and Parker um, that was uh, an output of this. So, as I just mentioned, any pound we can take out of the engine, we want to be able to do that. So here's kind of a schematic uh, uh, you know, of different components external, typically to the core of the engine. We think that we can probably take out somewhere between 500 to 1,000 pounds of weight eventually. We're not going to do it on the fuel nozzles, of course, that's not all the weight savings. But when we look at all the externals, when we look at different, different ideas that we have to radically change some of the components that are on a jet engine, we think we can take somewhere around 500 to 1,000 pounds out. And, and that is huge. And that translates into hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, in the life cycle of an engine, uh, collectively, for all the engines produced. And we think we'll also get performance gains. So designing to the process appropriately, efficiently, leveraging new materials, we think we can, uh, we can come up with tremendous uh, performance gain. So what's this mean? What, what's going to happen in our supply chain as we start to look at additive metals? Well, clearly for the fuel nozzle, this is pretty proprietary. It's first out part for aviation and for GE in a production setting. So GE will internally per, uh, have a production facility that we set up. Now, eventually, in a couple of years, we probably will have an external supply chain for that part as well. Uh, but ultimately, the supply chain is going to change pretty radically. And, and I think this is a, a really an interesting point because I would argue right now, and this is kind of hard for me because I was always on the other side of the fence, but in the last year I'm on this side of the fence, uh, I would argue the supply chain is very immature, if it even exists. I know there are suppliers that produce additive metal parts. I get that. But let's start narrowing that down. How many machines do they have? What kind of financial backing and capability do they have? What kind of certifications do they have? Uh, what kind of quality systems do they have? So for the aerospace market, I would argue for other markets as well, clearly, uh, medical and the such, uh, the, the systems and the barriers to entry will be very, very high. Now, it is true that in the last year or two years, a number of larger OEMs uh, and larger suppliers to these OEMs are starting to look at what is this additive. It's almost been an explosion of interest that's happened, hence probably why all of us are here. But no one is there yet. And let me give you an example. On the LEAP nozzle, on that LEAP uh, 56 fuel nozzle I just showed you, if we use today's technology, the state of the art today, we estimate we need probably 50 to 60 machines to handle that 40,000 part volume per year. It's one part, one engine program, one OEM manufacturer. So you can see we have a supply issue. We also have a supply opportunity if you want to look at it that way. So what phase are we in? Again, we've heard a lot, especially in the morning, a lot of interesting uh, uh, discussions and interesting talks. You know, I would argue that, that where we're at, both from a technology standpoint and from an application standpoint and from an acceptance standpoint, is we're pretty darn early in. I mean, this technology has really only been around, let's call it for 10 years. At least for us, it was 10 years with the metals. And then if you really want to narrow it further for useful alloys and, and, and material characterization, we're at five years or less. So we're very, very early in on this technology. And it's not just the technology itself. 
What about all the downstream capabilities you need? You need to be able to inspect. You need to be able to post-finish and post-machine. So we're in a very interesting period of time, but we're very early in. And although there is a lot of excitement, there is a lot of work to be done as well. So one of those challenges that we have is, uh, is, is the quality side of things. So I hope everybody knows that no engine manufacturer, I don't care if it's Rolls, I don't care if it's Pratt, GE, Honeywell, doesn't matter. No aircraft engine manufacturer, no air framer, and frankly, many other products are not going to, uh, OEMs or products are not going to put additive in to their product line unless they feel 100% sure that the quality and the reliability of those components uh, will survive the environments in which they're going into. So this becomes a very important and very uh, big issue for us is what we call our in-process quality assurance. So today's equipment and today's technology, all the OEMs are, are, are pushing towards this. So they want to have melt pool monitoring. They, they want to know what the atmosphere is and all those things we do need. But what do you do with these you know, gigabytes of data? How do you leverage and use that so that when you produce a component anywhere on that platform, you know exactly what you have coming out the other end. And by the way, I would say there are a number of service providers and people who are involved in the industry in the last five, 10 years that are actively working with uh, universities, working, you know, just doing the work themselves. So I think we're going to come to a point very soon where we're going to have some interesting solutions. Uh, GE, for instance, just recently signed a JTDA with Sigma Labs. They're one of the players in monitoring what's going on inside the equipment and being able to tell if you're building a whole batch of these parts if you have a problem in any one of those. So this doesn't take away the need to post inspect, but it's something that we have to get into the machines themselves. But clearly we're seeing an acceleration of adoption throughout the industry. There's still challenges though. I'll tell you one of the major challenges we have, and I'd love to know if anybody has any great ideas. We're working on it internally. We've been out to the vendor field and continue to work on it. But surface finish of metal parts. Why is that important? Well, internal surface finishes become a real problem when you're trying to life a part. Said differently, the low and high cycle fatigue issues radically go up when you have a rough surface. It becomes a crack propagation point and crack propagation is bad. Uh, that becomes a failure point. So you have to either design around it or get a good internal surface. So some of the complexity that we're able to do, which is phenomenal, uh, so, uh, creates a real problem on the back end. How do I get a smooth surface finish or how do I get at least an acceptable enough surface finish to overcome the debit? that I get from the rough surface finish. That's just one, but there's a, many, uh, there's a number of other uh, applications and capabilities that are being developed, worked on today. So we're going to see a huge amount of innovation, I think, within the next five to 10 years. And that'll be on the equipment side, on the alloy side, and on the downstream side. So GE Aviation clearly is uh, not the only one within big GE that's working with additive. Uh, we have a number of businesses, as everyone probably knows. So we have people in appliances and healthcare, power and water, oil and gas, just for example. And all of those businesses are beginning to use and leverage additive. In fact, GE Corporate uh, has bought into this technology, if you will, in a very big way. Uh, Part of that was expressed through the acquisition of our company, uh, but it's much broader than that. Uh, GE is trying to be out uh, uh, and recognized as being in the ecosystem, uh, as being uh, leveraging these technologies for their next products. Let me just give you another example. This one is coming from Power and Water. Uh, this particular guy um, is a, what we call a micro mixer. And this goes into one of the fueling components of a land-based gas uh, turbine engine. So this is a, typically not a small part. I'd give it about that big of a diameter maybe. So it's really not producible in today's bed technology, although a couple of equipment manufacturers are coming out with larger ones. So we make these in pie sections, which is sort of what you see. So this part was made by taking a bunch of tubes and then brazing them, sandwiching them and brazing them. And uh, there were about 1,000 tubes in there. So you have 1,000, about 2,000 braze joints because you have the top and the bottom. Very expensive um, and uh, prone to many failures. So what we had to do is design differently, think differently using additive. But we did. And ultimately, we are very close to producing a, a complete additively made uh, micro mixer that will be in some of the next generation land-based gas turbine engines. Um, the spoolies example that you see, the little green part, uh, that, actually, uh, that actually came off one of a uh, 3D systems little office modeler machine. And uh, 
that was just to show the example of what we could do, but ultimately we're making these, and you can see that in the very far right uh, part on that picture. We're making these uh, out of Inconel 718, I think, 625 or 718. And uh, those components, are, they look, it's a rather simple looking part. But to make that traditionally is evidently uh, uh, relatively expensive and long lead time. Uh, you take a tube and you fabricate it in some way. Additive actually fits pretty well. So we're working uh, to uh, produce a number of these components in Inco 718. Rather simple, but again, a time and a cost savings. Here's another GE power uh, and water example. This is a pretty mundane sort of, uh, sort of application, but uh, they had a problem with the chips they were producing off one of their machines. So, you know, this, is, uh, this isn't anything sexy and wonderful to talk about, not as much as the fuel nozzle, but clearly this is an application where additive came and played a huge role for them. So it was a big productivity enhancement. So instead of having to get in there and collect all these chips and move them out, uh, they, uh, the, the operator, actually, of the machine knew about the additive 3D capabilities within power and water and designed and came up with a, uh, a little chip holding device that was quick to move in and out. And I realize a very simple example, but in GE, we're trying to uh, really get that technology out to the masses, and these are great ways to do it. It doesn't always have to be the most complex part. So I think if I, you know, let's look at some broad trends quickly. I think number one, we haven't talked about this that I've heard about today, but the IP landscape is just fascinating. Uh, last year, I think there were something like 6,800 patents issued, uh, I'm sorry, submitted in, uh, in the US. So I don't know what the combined Europe, Asia, US uh, patent situation is. But within the US, the first to file has changed the landscape. So we have a huge number of patents being uh, submitted uh, for applications being submitted, and who knows where that goes. We typically don't find out what patents are out there uh, until maybe a year and a half or two years later. So that has significant ramifications for every OEM. As we begin to design products using additive, our competitors might have set, uh, put a patent in a year ago or a year and a half ago we don't know about until a year and a half later. And then you either have to license not a fun proposition, although it happens all the time, or you have to design around it. So very interesting. I think we're going to see a huge amount of consolidation happening, more consolidation, more Morris technologies. I think uh, large OEMs like GE and others will probably be acquiring different types of companies uh, related in the same space of the machines themselves. Um, I think uh, clearly we will see a, a absolute flood of applications. We're seeing it internally to GE, where designers and engineers that had heard of it but really hadn't applied it are now starting to leverage the technology in ways that are just phenomenal. In fact, GE was very progressive in putting out something called the Makers Guild internally, where we sent out uh, these little office printers and uh, we, we had teams of five and we sent uh, two to each business and, and I forget how many the initial was, maybe 20 different machines were sent out to these little groups. And the whole intent was to take people not uh, really familiar, hadn't, touching, hadn't been touching the technology very much, just print whatever, print something. So they did, they started to print a bunch of little parts and now I think we're up uh, past 50 or 60 machines throughout the corporation. So we're trying to get the, the message out that you can do a lot with 3D printing. So even though we don't use any of those parts in any of our uh, production components, uh, it, it's helping to educate and education is a huge issue. Um, and, and clearly, I think uh, we will see, as I talked about in the other slide, uh, an increasing amount of innovation in the industry. And then most exciting, we talked, uh, I've heard a couple other people talk about this, are, are the different business models. So, man, I wish I were 20 years, well, I wish I was probably 30 years younger, but if I were 20 years younger, at least, I'd probably would be coming up with some pretty cool business ideas. Um, things I can't even imagine how people uh, are going to use and leverage additive in general. But we also have some needs. And, and I think one of the things, you know, we get, we get caught up on this, but we're trying to reach out as best we can and as, uh, uh, I guess, as appropriately as we can to say we can't do this alone. And, and, and let's be very clear, GE is a huge company, but there is no company that can push this technology to where it needs to go by themselves. We need collaborations, and that includes our competitors. It, it's very expensive to qualify and characterize a single alloy for production use. It's probably somewhere around two to three million dollars at a minimum. So it is very expensive, very time consuming. It's a lot easier to do that in, in co uh, collaboration with others. And we certainly need to see that supply chain mature. And GE will be a part of helping to mature that supply chain. So I think I made it to about within 30 seconds. So I have, anybody have any question at all that I can quickly answer in that remaining few seconds? Yeah. 
Oh, so uh, my view versus uh, laser versus EBM. So very quickly, yeah, they're two, they're, they're complementary technologies. Uh, so for us, the fuel nozzle would not work in EBM, not because it can't produce the metal or uh, consolidate it well, can, uh, but I have two problems, uh, although the Q10 may solve some of it. Um, is surface finish, um, and that the Q10 may solve because it's a much better surface finish. My biggest single problem is getting the powder out of the, the trap powder out of the passage. And, and EBM today still tends to have a, a, a bit of a, a pseudo centered powder and in, in, uh, internal cavities that I can't get out. And there are a number of very complex passages in that field nozzle, so I can't I can't get the powder out. But uh, we look at them as complementary. Um, I think both technologies have tremendous opportunities, and uh, we see. Uh, the laser-based system right now, today, having more alloy p potential and opportunities. We see the EBM technology able to do some things that the laser-based has real problems with, like high-temperature alloys, tie aluminides, your Rene's, some of those real high-temperature crack alloys uh, that laser-based systems will have a lot of issues with right now. So I think I'm out of time, and uh, thank you for your time and, and attention.